everyone. So we're going to take a look at a number of different models that we have in the classroom in our science lab. And we're going to start with the brain and then we'll take a look at the eye and we'll also take a look at the ear. So looking at the brain, here's a great model that we have in the lab. We do not see the meninges on the brain. Of course, these are removed for the purpose of using these models and the pia mater would be the one that is stuck directly to the brain. There are two terms that I wanna point out to you since we have the brain right in front of us right now. So first term would be gyrus or gyri plural. Okay, so the gyri are all of these hills or all these structures that kind of look like worms or bumps on the brain. Those are all the gyri. The sulci, the sulci are going to be all of these, these valleys, all these indentations that we have with the brain. Okay, so all of these are your sulci. The gyri are all of these bumps. Okay, so gyri versus sulci, very important term to note. So going through our anatomy ID list, looking at the brain, we do have four apparent lobes. So the four lobes of the brain that we have would be the frontal lobe in the front, right here. We also have the parietal lobe up here on the top. We have the occipital lobe in the back. We have the temporal lobe here on the side. There is that fifth lobe, the insula, which is deep to this temporal lobe. It's kind of along this fissure, which is known as a lateral fissure which runs right here. And if you were to open that up, between the temporal lobe, parietal, and frontal lobe, you would see in here, you would see that insula, that fifth lobe. Okay, so as far as these fissures are concerned, longitudinal fissure, that's how we would cut the brain. There would be another hemisphere over here. Okay, for a full brain. Okay, so here we're just looking at half, of course. So this is half of the cerebrum. There would be another half here. And this is your longitudinal fissure. This cuts the brain directly in half. We also have a central sulcus, okay, which is going to split the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. We also have a parietal occipital sulcus, which splits the parietal lobe from the occipital lobe. So that runs right here. We did the lateral fissure, longitudinal, central sulcus. Okay, so we have all of those covered. A fissure is just deeper and wider compared to a sulcus. We did the insula, cerebrum here, cerebellum is this guy right here. Cerebellum you can see also has the gyri and the sulci, but they're just much smaller compared to the gyri and sulci of the cerebrum. We take a look at this side. So now we're looking at the inside of the brain. So imagine we did our cut here. You'll see in dissections exactly how we cut the brain. And now if we look at the inside, this white region right here, it's kind of shaped like a gigantic letter C. This is that corpus callosum. Okay, so corpus callosum is this guy. Pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland would hang off of the brain right here from the hypothalamus region. Okay, so the pituitary gland would be right here. Okay. Next up on our list, we have optic chiasma. That is where we're going to find the uh, you can kind of see it if I hold it in this manner. Okay, so pituitary gland would come off here. Optic chiasma, this looks like it says number 84. Um, it's going to kind of have like an X shaped structure or half of an X here, kind of like a V. But off of this guy would come your optic nerve, then you'd have the eyeball here. Okay, so optic chiasma is where the optic nerve makes that connection between the brain and the eyeball. As far as ventricles are concerned, ventricles are the open spaces in the brain where we find cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. 
this big opening right here that the pencil is stuck into. This is the lateral ventricle. Third ventricle surrounds this green guy. This green guy is the thalamus. So this is all the third ventricle. You can kind of see that depression it kind of surrounds that thalamus. That's the third ventricle. There's this long passageway. That's your cerebral aqueduct leading on down to this open space right here. This is going to be your fourth ventricle right in front of your cerebellum. So fourth ventricle, cerebral aqueduct coming up this way right here. And then we have our third, vent or our third ventricle here and then our lateral ventricle here. Okay, so it goes lateral, third, cerebral aqueduct, fourth. This is a pretty handy model as well. It shows the ventricles of the brain. This guy right here, this is your lateral ventricle. This is your third. This long tail right here coming on down, let's look this way. This is the cerebral aqueduct. And then this guy right down here is the fourth ventricle. So this is a filling model of all the open spaces in the brain. Okay, so again, this guy, your lateral ventricle, is this open space right in here. It's pretty nifty. Looking at the cerebellum, this is the cerebellum. The white structure that you see on the inside that's your tree of life. That's your arbor vitae. Your diencephalon contains the thalamus, hypothalamus, pineal gland. That's kind of this like central region here of the brain. Okay, all of this. So if we take a look here, thalamus is the green structure. All that is the thalamus. Hypothalamus is kind of what's below the thalamus. So this region here. This is where we're gonna find the optic chiasma and the pituitary gland. And then we have what's known as the pineal gland. Pineal gland is back here. So if we look at this model, pineal gland would be this little green dot right there. Okay. These guys are your corpora quadrigemina. They're not on your list, but those are your corpora quadrigemina. Those two circular bumps here and here. And then here's your pineal gland. With the brainstem, this little structure here is part of the spinal cord, which of course would be way down here. This first bump that kind of jots out anteriorly is the medulla. This large one is the pons. Okay, so pons, medulla, and then right up here, this would be the midbrain. Okay, so midbrain, pons, medulla. Those are the regions of the brainstem. Next up, let's take a look at the eye. This is a great model of the eye. We can see it's sitting here. Here's going to be the, the nose, okay, nasal cavity here. So here we see the eyeball all set up. Let's go ahead and kind of pop this guy out so we can take a look at it in more detail. So looking at the eye up here, we see a gland. This is a lacrimal gland. This is going to secrete tears, which cover the eyeball itself. They're gonna drain over here on the medial aspect of the eye. This is going to be the superior lateral aspect of the eye. Okay, so if this was my eye, it would be my right eye sitting right here. So this is lateral. Down here is medial where the tears are gonna eventually fall. Looking at the eye, the white of the eye, which is very hard, difficult to cut through, is the sclera. This clear section, this is going to be the cornea. With this eye, you can also note all of these muscles that connect to the eye. So we have four rectus muscles, medial, lateral, inferior, superior, and then we also have the superior and inferior oblique. See one here. And then we can see the other one here. Okay, so we had a couple obliques, okay, superior and inferior. And then we have the rectus, which are the straight ones. 
And if we were to contract the superior rectus, just imagine pulling back on this as it's connected to the white of the eye, the eyeball would look up. If we pull this one on the bottom, eyeball would look down. We pull this one medially, look like you're cross-eyed, right? Okay, and then to look laterally, pull that one, look that way. Okay, so that's all the muscles that connect to the sclera, the white of the eye. So these are your extrinsic muscles because they're on the outside of the eyeball. Now, if we were to look at the inside of the eyeball, I'm going to transition to another model just because this one's all taped. Okay, same thing, just a little bit smaller. Here's your lacrimal gland. You can still see the muscles. This one we can open up like so. On the inside, you can see the retina, be more of a yellowish color, but the retina back here. This that looks like the gills of a mushroom. That's going to be your ciliary body or ciliary muscle. It's part of the choroid. The choroid on um, this model, you really can't, well, you can kind of see the outline of it. It's that dark brown. It's going to be behind the retina. Okay, so the choroid, you can see the sclera, the white of the eye goes all the way around the eye. It's going to be sclera, then the dark brown choroid and then the yellow retina. So those are your three layers, sclera, choroid, retina. This anterior aspect of the eyeball, this clear structure here, that of course is going to be the cornea. The hole is the pupil. Okay, so the hole is the pupil. The colored part of the eye, and in this particular model, it's brown. This is the iris. If you had blue eyes, the iris would be blue and so on. Iris controls the shape of the pupil, not the shape, the size of the pupil, which I guess would be shape, but anyways, the size. Okay, so again, we can constrict the pupil, make it smaller, or dilate the pupil and make it larger. Okay, so again, that iris, is an intrinsic eye muscle that's found on the inside of the eye that controls the size of the pupil. The ciliary muscle here, this is going to control the shape of the lens. So the lens we find here, we find it behind, this is the anterior part of the eye. Move that, here's the lens. Okay, so the lens kind of had a marble shape that we saw in the uh, dissection. The lens, you can see you can actually use it to magnify. Okay, so the lens can thicken or flatten depending if you need to see closer or further away. And then in the posterior region, the eyeball all back here, this is all that jelly-like vitreous humor. And then in the anterior aspect of the eyeball in the front here is where you find all the, the watery aqueous humor. In the back, the optic disc would be here. This is where the optic nerve connects to the eyeball itself, okay, to, the, to the retina specifically, and then optic nerve would be back here. On this model, the other model we can see just that, So if we take a look back here, we can see this, let's see if I can remove another muscle. You can see the optic nerve connects to the back of the eyeball. That connection point is the optic disc. This is the optic nerve, which would be leading to the brain. Let's taking a look at the eye. Next up, we'll take a look at the ear. Kind of a large model, so a little bit of space. Okay, so here we're looking at the ear. This is the external ear. This would be referred to as the pinna. Okay, so pinna or oracle. This is external ear structure. As we make our way in, 
We're going to make our way in here. We're going to hit this structure, which is our tympanic membrane. And this is our eardrum, which if I remove it, our eardrum. These are little ear ossicles, malleus, incus, and stapes. We're going to tap on that. First the malleus, then the incus, and then the stapes. What these guys are going to do, okay, as these sound waves hit that tympanic membrane, what's going to happen is we're going to rock all three of those in succession. So malleus first, then incus, and then stapes. And the stapes is actually, that one is still sitting here in the ear. That one we can see right here, it looks like a stirrup. That one is against the oval window. So it tap, tap, taps on that oval window, which gets all this fluid on the inside of the ear to move. And that's going to help us with our sense of hearing. A little bit more about that process in the lecture. Okay, so now, that would be your middle ear region with all the bones, and this would be the inner ear region. So if we look at the inner ear, and then of course we have our, uh, if we take a look here, external auditory or acoustic meatus, and then here we have our auditory canal, which connects to the throat. This is gonna equalize pressure between the ear and the outside atmosphere. Okay, so if you go on a plane, you'll notice your ears kind of feel like they're popping. And what happens is this auditory canal isn't always open, okay? But when you swallow, you kind of open and close it like that, but it's gonna to help to kind of equalate that, uh, that pressure. Equilibrate that pressure. Okay, so anyways, again, external ear with the pinna, the oracle here. External acoustic meatus, ear canal, as we lead in, we tap on that tympanic membrane, that eardrum, malleus incus stapes. Stapes is going to push on that oval window, which is right here. And then if we look at the ear, the inner ear is extremely complex. The vestibule is kind of this middle area right here. Okay, so this is all vestibule. This is the cochlea. You can see it kind of looks like a snail. And then over here, these are your semicircular canals. So your semicircular canals are used for balance, for equilibrium. So the type of equilibrium would be dynamic equilibrium. And then your vestibule here in the middle is for static equilibrium. So giving you a sense of like gravity, for example, your body in reference to, to gravity. Dynamic equilibrium is, is uh, movement. I have another ear model. Let me show you these structures on the other ear. Okay, so here we're taking a look at the other ear model. Okay, so looking at this particular model, here we're looking at the external ear. This is the oracle or the pinna. This opening, external acoustic or external auditory canal. Okay, so as we come in, these sound waves move this way and they tap on this tympanic membrane. You hit this tympanic membrane, okay, and these ear ossicles are going to amplify that sound. There's the eardrum, tympanic membrane. We have the malleus, which is the one directly attached to it, and then the incus, and then we have the stapes with the inner ear. Okay. That's the outside of the tympanic membrane. This is the inside. The malleus is the one attached to it, and then we have this guy, the incus, and then this guy connects to the stapes, which is right here and looks like a stirrup, as you can see. And then on the inside, it attaches the stirrup, the stapes connects to that oval window. There's a lot of fluid on the inside of the ear. This is the vestibule for equilibrium, static equilibrium. 
These are your semicircular canals for dynamic equilibrium. They sit at three different right angles to each other. And this little snail-like structure, this is your cochlea. This is where we find the organ of cordy. This is for hearing. Okay, so hearing, cochlea, vestibule and semicircular canals, equilibrium. This nerve right here, this is cranial nerve number eight. It's called the vestibulocochlear nerve. Vestibulo, because some of the fibers are coming from the vestibule region, which is for equilibrium from the semicircular canals in the vestibule. And then cochlear, because these nerve fibers are coming from the cochlea for hearing. So vestibulocochlear nerve for hearing and equilibrium. And that's going to conclude a look at our models.